For this episode, we thank the old gods and the new, and Skillshare. Get two months free beyond the wall by signing up at the link below. Don't you hate it when a channel tries to shamelessly ride a hype train and talk about something completely unrelated to its usual content? So, Game of Thrones, am I right? Yes, we're going to examine whether it was really possible to resurrect Jon Snow. And although we're using fantasy fiction, we're going to explore the science fiction effects of deep hypothermia. Cardiac arrest ward 6, cardiac arrest ward 6. What do we say to the god of death? Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire have some nice medical touches, drawing inspiration from medieval medicine. Although significantly more advanced and, um, well, there's magic. But I'm going to propose a scenario where Jon Snow's resurrection might actually have been possible with real-life medicine. Time of death, 3.06 p.m. Thank you, everyone. He came to us from the emergency department. He smoked 40 a day and ate nothing but donuts. We will never see his like again. Well, we probably will, actually. And now, his watch has ended. One of my jobs in the hospital is to run resuscitations for patients who've had a cardiac arrest unless they're American, in which case we call it a code blue. Let me start with some grim statistics. Around 95% of people who have a cardiac arrest outside hospital wow. die. Most are dead before they make it to hospital. The in-hospital survival rate is also fairly appalling, with around 80% dying. The reason it's slightly better than out of hospital is because the cardiac arrest team can get there quicker, because for every minute that passes without output from the heart, survival drops drastically. Indeed, for the vast majority of people, irreversible brain damage will occur within the first three to eight minutes. Once you get past 10 minutes without a pulse, it's extremely unlikely the person will make any meaningful recovery. You might restart their heart, but they could be left in a coma due to brain damage. But there is one way you can increase your chances. If you're planning to get ambushed by your subordinates and stabbed to death for allowing wildlings into the photocopying room, make sure you do it somewhere that's extremely cold. Little Ollie. There's a famous expression in medicine that nobody is dead until they're warm and dead. What this means is that a profoundly cold person might show absolutely no signs of life, but you can't truly tell if they've made a celestial transfer to the seven heavens until you warm them back up to near the temperature at which the body is supposed to operate. Kill the boy and let the man be born. Yes. I'm afraid you failed your paediatrics exam. I first saw this in practice when I was a freshly chained maester working in a large emergency department in the UK and a young person who had drowned in cold December waters was brought in. They were, for all intents and purposes, dead. Their heart had not beaten for 10 minutes by the time they got into hospital and it would be another 20 before we saw any cardiac activity. A further hour before their body temperature approached anything like normal and yet they went on to make a full neurological recovery. The cold had protected their brain. The most important thing to take away from this video is that there are two interventions that you can do to increase someone's likelihood of surviving a cardiac arrest. Good chest compressions and early defibrillation with something like an AED, an automated defibrillator. It's psoriasis, Khaleesi. Defibrillation won't work if your patient is a popsicle, but obviously you should still try. But in hypothermia, it's all about the chest compressions. Luckily, these days we have machines to do this work because humans get tired quickly. And as soon as the force of compressions lets up or you pause to swap over, it can take a while to re-establish that perfusion pressure. I've seen the night doctor. I've looked into his eyes. My brothers believe me when I tell you. Admissions are coming. Our department had recently had an educational meeting about end tidal CO2, that's measuring the amount of carbon dioxide in the gas coming out of somebody's lungs, and its use in hypothermic cardiac arrest. So we used this to show that the patient was still alive. 
When somebody is intubated, you push oxygen into their lungs. If there's no metabolic activity, you'll just get the same oxygen coming back out. But what we could see was that oxygen was being consumed and carbon dioxide was being produced. So it meant that we were doing a good job with our mechanical chest compressions circulating the blood. Sansa, you have cancer. Yet a total of 30 minutes of downtime is really nothing compared to a few famous cases. Some years ago, professional footballer Fabrice Moamba suffered a cardiac arrest whilst playing a match. He was rushed to a specialist cardiac centre, where he was treated by a huge team, including a few friends of mine. In total, his heart didn't beat for 78 minutes, but effective CPR saved his life and left him with absolutely no neurological deficit. That cardiac arrest occurred at normal temperature, and it should be emphasised that Fabrice was a supremely fit young person. But when you add cold into the equation, you can push into entirely new territory. A 30-year-old Japanese woman was found with no pulse in a cold forest, and she had a core temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, suggesting that she'd collapsed some hours earlier. Our normal body temperature should be 37 degrees Celsius. Anything less than 28 degrees is regarded as severe hypothermia. For viewers not used to using Celsius, that's 301 Kelvin. Her heart would not beat for another six and a half hours. She eventually went home with a mild left-sided weakness, but her cognitive function was entirely intact. A well-known case in medical circles is grippingly described in Kevin Fong's fantastic book, Extremes. 29-year-old Anna Bagenholm was skiing in remote Norwegian mountains when she fell under a sheet of ice and became stuck, partially submerged in freezing cold water, which started to cool her rapidly. When hypothermia grips you, changes start occurring in your body. Blood is diverted away from your skin, hairs stand up, and you begin to shiver. This builds to a violent, uncontrollable shivering that can consume almost half of your energy and paradoxically accelerate your demise. You become delirious, I saw a mountaineer in the Himalaya strip off his clothes, convinced he was overheating, and this is quite a frequent occurrence in later hypothermia. Terminal burrowing is the term given to the strange tendency for someone to go into an enclosed space, like into a cupboard or under a rock. As it occurs quite late, it's often sometimes described as hide and die. It's thought to be mediated by the brainstem akin to mammals burrowing into the ground for hibernation. Eventually the heart slows, the brain shuts down, and life ebbs away. Forty minutes after she fell into the water, Anna had gone limp and unresponsive. By the time help arrived, eighty minutes had passed, and by the time she got to hospital, her heart had not beaten for at least two hours. Her core temperature was, at the time, the lowest ever recorded in a person that went on to live, at 13.7 degrees Celsius. The receiving doctors described her as having absolutely no signs of life, looking white and waxy like a corpse. But the team at Tromso were used to dealing with hypothermia, and they knew what to do. Soon, she was on a heart-lung bypass machine, which could warm her blood. No less than three hours after her cardiac arrest, Anna's heart beat on its own. The cherry on top of this heartwarming story is that although Anna's recovery was long, she eventually qualified as a radiologist and now works at the very same hospital that saved her life in Tromso. So can anybody tell me how an intramedullary nail like this one be introduced into the bone. I'd bring me war hammer down upon it. We can harness the protective power of cold in medicine. In transplantation, we talk about warm and cold ischemic time, i.e. when the organ has no blood supply. Warm ischemic time is measured in minutes, but once on ice, some organs can be viable for several hours. In a previous video, I briefly talked about deep hypothermia used in cardiac surgery, where we cool the body to about 18 degrees Celsius, and again produce this state, which is practically indistinguishable from death. That warms the heart. It's important to remember that all three of the cases that I've talked about were young, fit people. I don't want to give the impression that any of this is normal. These were freak cases. But you came here to learn about Jon Snow. Wait a minute. A neuron just fired in his cerebral cortex. There it is again. His nerves. 
His nerves are still transmitting electrical impulses to his brain. How can that be? His brain activity is zero. I think it would be fair to say that John is also young and fit, perhaps even as fit as Fabrice Muemba, so that counts in his favor. We might be able to revive him. What about brain damage? There's been no oxygen to his brain for almost 40 minutes. But he's been in stasis for most of that time. I've been unable to find out the ambient temperature at Castle Black, but let's just agree it's right parky. It's hard to know how much time passes between John's death and his reanimation, but as you've already heard, best case scenario, we've got about seven hours to play with. But I do have to take issue with Davos, Tormund, and Dolores Ed. They really make absolutely no attempt at chest compressions, and we know that this is a key factor in the survival of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. People feel afraid to have a go. Please do. If somebody's heart has stopped, you literally can't make it any worse. Melisandre looks like she's about to, but her CPR technique is really quite abysmal. So John receives no ventilation nor chest compressions. He's also died from a hemorrhagic or hypovolemic cardiac arrest, meaning he bled to death. So there's very little blood in his body. He's got a bunch of whopping great wounds, including one to the heart, and below 28 degrees Celsius, blood loses most of its ability to clot. Put a knife in my heart. So we'd need to deal with that. From the top, if John had had immediate effective chest compressions and intubation with end tidal CO2 monitoring, rapid infusion of O-negative blood, intraoperative autologous blood transfusion, major hemorrhage protocol clotting factors and plasma, establishments on veno-arterial extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, allowing repair of his wounds, a level 3 bed with one-to-one -one nursing and intensive physiotherapy, then yes, I think we could have saved John. But seeing as this is Game of Thrones, luckily we can just say... Magic. He can kill a white and cure grayscale, but Samwell's books have taught him nothing about photography, which came as a great disappointment to Gilly. But never fear, because Skillshare can help him and you in your hour of need. Turn to the Red Priestess, otherwise known as Lotus Carol, and together you can worship the Lord of Lightroom as she guides you on your path to photographic glory. Or if you want to send a raven animated in Kurzgesagt's unmistakable style, now you can learn how with an easy to follow guide. I might employ these skills in my forthcoming video essay about justice. Is that what you tell yourself at night? That you're a servant of justice? Rick, I need a hot bath and maybe a bath bomb. Come on, Glenn. Look into the flames. Or let Mike Boyd, the king, beyond the wall, teach you how he learns things so fast. If that doesn't tempt you to sign up for Skillshare, then A, you're madder than Ares Targaryen, and B, maybe this will, the first 500 people to sign up via the link below, get two months absolutely free with access to over 20,000 classes. I clicked on exactly that same offer after watching a certain Emu's video, I guess about a year ago, and I've stayed a premium member ever since because I genuinely find it very useful. So go and check it out. Not only will you learn something, but it also helps this channel. I'm going to do a little Maester's AMA in the comments below for a little bit, so if you've got any burning medieval medical questions, now's your chance. I'll sign off by saying to you what I say to all my patients when they're admitted to hospital. Wait a second.